It's been 18 months since NASA was challenged to land the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024. Now the agency finally has a formal plan published. What is it? Is it different from what we already know? And how much will it cost? And most importantly, will it actually allow NASA to meet the goal of landing on the lunar surface by 2024? But before we get into the details of the Artemis program, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for even more content. There has been a lot of discussion about how exactly NASA intends to return humans to the moon by 2024. Much of the plan has already been public in details here and there, but not in one complete document. NASA changed that on September 21st, 2020, when it published Artemis Plan, NASA's Lunar Exploration Program Overview. Early in the announcement of the Artemis program, the agency's ambitions for the lunar return were split into two phases. The first phase would be about getting back to the moon fast and retire as much political and financial risk as soon as possible. Phase two would focus on establishing a sustainable presence of human activity on and around the moon, utilizing commercial and international partners by the end of the decade. This phase would also begin to test technologies regarding sending humans to Mars in the 2030s, such as utilizing local resources for water, air, and fuel. This won't be a cheap endeavor, however. I'll get into the expected cost of phase one at the end of the video. The two big vehicles in the Artemis program are the Space Launch System, or SLS, and the Orion spacecraft. Both have had ups and downs in the development, some technical and some political, over the last 15 years or so. I won't get into that here, but you can watch this video right here for more information. There will also be a link in the description. With SLS and Orion now in the final stages of testing and processing before their first fully integrated test flight, Artemis 1, slated for November 2021, the agency is starting to focus on a few other key elements needed for the first human landing during the Artemis 3 mission in 2024. This includes robotic precursor missions, surface exploration units, and of course, human landing systems. Meanwhile, NASA will continue to lay the foundation for a key feature of Phase 2, which is the Lunar Gateway, a station placed in a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon, which will serve as a relay station and staging area for all Artemis missions beyond the Artemis 3 flight. Starting with the precursor missions, one thing NASA has begun doing is award contracts for several commercial companies to send small autonomous landers to the Moon to send various scientific payloads to the lunar surface. These contracts fall under the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program and is a high-risk, high-reward effort. The goal is to send two CLPS missions to the moon a year, starting in 2021. The most prominent payload is arguably NASA's VIPER, which stands for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. The current plan is for VIPER to land on the moon via an astrobotic lander on the South Pole to investigate the amount of water ice and other resources located in permanently shadowed craters. Although not part of CLIPS, another precursor mission is Capstone, Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. NASA likes its acronyms. This small CubeSat is slated to launch atop a Rocket Lab Electron vehicle in early 2021 from Virginia and be sent to a near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon where all crewed Artemis landing missions will stage from. The task of this tiny vehicle is to help better understand the orbit the Lunar Gateway will be positioned in and where Orion will rendezvous with pre-positioned human landing systems. It will demonstrate how to enter and how to operate in this orbit and test a new navigation capability. While the precursor missions are underway, NASA will still be testing the SLS and Orion spacecraft. The first mission, Artemis 1, is targeting a launch by November 2021, and will see an uncrewed Orion spacecraft be placed on a path toward a lunar distant retrograde orbit, traveling some 65,000 kilometers beyond the moon, or about 450,000 kilometers from Earth. This month-long mission is expected to gather data about how Orion performs in flight in deep space, on the journey to the moon, and how it functions around our nearest neighbor. It'll test how to get into and out of this distant orbit, and then, critically, test the heat shield during re-entry at Mach 32, nearly 40,000 kilometers per hour, before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. This test mission will also deploy 13 CubeSats on its way to the moon for scientific investigations about the deep space environment around the moon. I plan to do a more in-depth video about the Artemis 1 mission at a later date. The next flight after this will be the 10-day-long crewed Artemis 2 mission scheduled for sometime in 2023. 
its trajectory will be much different than that of Artemis 1. After launching into space with four astronauts inside the Orion capsule, the spacecraft and the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, will be placed into a 185 km by 2900 km insertion orbit around Earth, lasting about 90 minutes. At the top of this orbit, the ICPS will briefly fire to raise the low point of the stack's orbit just a bit. After the first 90 minute orbit is complete, the ICPS will fire again to place the stack into a 42 hour long high Earth orbit, flying between 320 kilometers and 95,000 kilometers. During this orbit, the crew will detach from the ICPS and perform several proximity operations demonstrations to test Orion's handling characteristics during eventual rendezvous and docking operations and future Artemis missions. During the remainder of the orbit, the crew will verify other systems such as life support and communications. For example, while below the Global Positioning Satellite Systems and Tracking and Data Relay Satellite Systems altitudes, Orion will be able to utilize it for communication and location. Beyond those orbits, near the top of the High Earth orbit, the crew will be able to test out communications using the Deep Space Network and other Deep Space Navigation capabilities. Once back in the low part of its second orbit, the Orion Service Module will perform a translunar injection, pushing it on a path for a lunar-free return trajectory. The outbound flight will last about four days, and they'll swing beyond the moon to more than 370,000 kilometers away from Earth before swinging back toward home. This free return trajectory means little or no fuel will be needed for course correction. According to NASA, during the farthest point of the flight, the crew will be about 7,400 kilometers beyond the moon and will be able to see the Earth and moon in Orion's windows. Now just imagine what that would look like. It could be the Apollo 8 Earthrise image of the Artemis generation. After its close approach, the Artemis II crew will take another four days to return to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere in the same way that was done during the Artemis I flight splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. While NASA works on the first two Artemis missions and CLPS is progressing, the biggest item needed to be developed, tested, and flown in just four years is one or more commercial human landing system designs. Right now, NASA is in an initial phase to help three companies develop their human landing system concepts to the point where NASA can make a selection. I already did a video about the Dynetics Lander and its single stage element with modular propellant tanks to be dropped off during descent. You can see the link here or in the description below. Another company is Blue Origin and its national team of Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper. Together, the four companies are looking to build a three stage lander that would get between the halo orbit and the surface of the moon only the descent stage would not be reused, at least initially. There's also SpaceX and its single-stage Starship-based lunar lander. NASA is likely to down-select to one or two designs by early 2021, and will also make a decision to which lander would be used for the Artemis 3 mission and which would be used for the Artemis 4, etc. Aside from the aggressive schedule of the HLS program, the biggest risk will be getting the needed funding, which I'll talk about in the cost section later in the video. Once ready to go to the surface, the crew won't just be looking out the window and taking pictures. They'll need a new spacesuit to step outside. That's where the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU, comes in. NASA has been working to develop new suits for a while now since its current EMUs being used at the International Space Station are 40 years old and in limited supply. An upgraded suit design not only helps with surface exploration, it would also mean the ISS program could get new spacesuits. Another item being developed for surface operations is an unpressurized lunar terrain vehicle. However, it's unclear if this will be ready and pre-positioned in time for the Artemis 3 mission. Once all of these elements are in place and tested, NASA will begin the first expedition to the moon's surface in more than 50 years with the Artemis 3 mission. After launching atop an SLS rocket, four astronauts in an Orion spacecraft will travel to a near rectilinear halo orbit where one of three potential HLS systems will be waiting. Two astronauts will board, likely one man and one woman, and travel first to a low lunar orbit and then to their targeted landing zone near the moon's south pole. The surface mission is expected to last about a week, with between two and four moonwalks being performed. The astronauts are expected to collect a variety of samples to return to Earth. Between moonwalks, the crew will rest inside the ascent module for their lander. Once their surface stay is completed, the lander will be returned to a low lunar orbit before boosting again to the near rectilinear halo orbit to meet Orion with their other two crew members. And that's the short version of phase one of the Artemis program. Phase two activities will have already started by the time Artemis three lands on the moon. This includes the launch and positioning of the lunar gateway in the near rectilinear halo orbit. It also means more eclipse missions and more pre-staging of equipment for Artemis four and beyond. 
The goal is to build up the gateway and what will become known as Artemis Base Camp on the moon's south pole to allow for yearly visits lasting between a couple of weeks or months. International partners are expected to develop their own elements, such as a robotic arm and an international habitat module for both the gateway and the surface. A pressurized rover is also being planned. Eventually, the hope is to develop a constellation of LunaNet spacecraft around the moon to help with navigation and communication in much the same way similar constellations work here on Earth. During both phases, NASA and its international partners plan to perform all kinds of unique science, both aboard the Gateway and on the surface, whether it's at a Clips landing location or at Artemis Base Camp. The long-term goal of the Artemis Moon missions is to ready humanity for trips to Mars by testing key technologies such as in-situ resource utilization, using the resources of the Moon or Mars, to make key consumables such as water, air, and fuel. We can also use the Gateway and Artemis Base Camp for a full simulation of a two-year Mars mission by having a crew fly to Gateway, stay there for several months, land and stay for several months on the surface, and then return to the Gateway for several months before returning back to Earth. The hope is to use the knowledge gained to send people to Mars sometime in the 2030s using similar hardware and commercial and international partnerships. But as the saying goes, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. How much will this cost, and will the U.S. Congress actually fund it? While no cost estimates have been released for the Phase 2 of Artemis, NASA has released its estimate for Phase 1 through the fiscal year 2025, which starts on October 1st, 2024. In total, NASA expects to spend about $28 billion for Phase 1 activities. This includes the remainder of SLS and Orion development, all of the human landing system development, lunar spacesuits and other surface logistics, etc. The biggest line item, however, is the human landing system, $16.2 billion, which is more than half of the $28 billion needed. This also doesn't include NASA's normal budget for things such as the ISS or robotic solar system exploration, etc. For fiscal year 2021, NASA requested $3.2 billion for the HLS program, and the U.S. House of Representatives' draft funding bill would only give them about $628 million. A similar bill will have to be drafted and agreed upon by the U.S. Senate and signed by the President, but for now, it appears that a continuing resolution is going to be in effect between October 1st and early December of this year. That means NASA's budget and the rest of the government will be held at 2020 levels for that duration. Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, says he's confident that they'll get the money needed in some form of omnibus bill later this year or early next year. He was frank, however, about the reality of the situation. We need that $3.2 billion for the human landing system. And I think that if we can have that done before Christmas, we're still on track for a 2024 moon landing. If Congress doesn't fund the moon landing program, then it, it won't be achieved. I mean, it's, it's, it's really that simple. Now, I want to be clear, if they push the funding off, our goal will be to get to the moon at the earliest possible opportunity. Speed is still of the essence, and sustainability follows speed. So, NASA is the closest it's been in 50 years to returning to the moon. All of the pieces are in place and are being developed and built. If the funding hurdle can be overcome, this generation can truly look at itself as the Artemis generation even if 2024 slips to 2026 or even 2028. So what do you think of Phase 1 Artemis program plans? Is it achievable politically? Do you think NASA can achieve a 2024 landing, assuming the funding even materializes? And what do you think NASA means when they say they want to create a sustainable presence on and around the moon? As always, let me know in the comments below. If I've earned it, it'd mean the world to me if you could subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and share this video as well as others with friends and family. It helps to support the channel and also lets me know what topics you're all interested in regarding human space exploration. You can also follow Orbital Velocity on Twitter and Facebook. Additionally, you can visit orbital-velocity.com for even more space-related content, including a monthly newsletter called The Space Capsule. Links are always in the description. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, at Astra.